Ideology is a set of beliefs or opinions of a group or an individual person. Ideology can be found in every film we watch. Films can often be supporting the dominant or emerging ideology, or challenging them. In this video essay, we'll look at how Jonathan Demme's film, The Silence of the Lambs, reinforces key tenets of second wave feminism, and how Darius Smarter's film, Sound of Metal, challenges ableist ideology. Second wave feminism took place in the 1960s and the 1970s and focused on the issues of discrimination and equality. They were fighting for more female leadership in higher education, businesses and politics. The Silence of the Lambs was released in 1991, 21 years after these rights were fought for. At the time of release, more and more women were focusing on higher education and their careers. However, this did not mean discrimination was over especially for women in the workforce. As there was still a patriarchal belief that women belong in the kitchen and men were superior. The Silence of the Lambs was adapted from Thomas Harris's 1988 psychological horror novel of the same name. The film follows Clarice Starling, an FBI agent seeking help from Hannibal Lecter, a serial killer and a former psychiatrist in order to find and arrest another serial killer who has been killing female victims. By using a range of codes and conventions, Jonathan Demme perfectly depicts how it feels to be discriminated against as a woman in the workforce. He does this in his scene of Clarice Starling at a funeral parlour about to go view the body of one of James Gum's victims. Specifically, Demme uses the fish out of water convention to portray this, which is essentially when a character is placed in a completely unsuitable environment or situation. This narrative convention is used in many films to show that a female character is feeling out of place in her environment. So if we break down this scene, straight away we can see that blocking in the construction of the mise-en-scene has been carefully used. Blocking helps us to see the power dynamics in different conversations on screen. Crawford and Perkins take up most of the screen while Clarice can barely be seen. Not only does this show us she is physically out of the conversation, but by framing her further from the lens, the audience gets a sense of just how out of place she is made to feel in her work environment. Demi then cuts to a close-up of her face to focus on her emotional reaction, which is somewhat confronted and disorientated. This is further emphasized when Crawford asks to discuss certain matters in private. But how does Demi take the audience from seeing how Clarice is being treated to feeling what she is? Well, he first carefully sets up the scene with a high angle camera shot, establishing that she is surrounded by male police officers. Then it cuts to the faces of the police officers staring straight down the barrel of the camera lens. These faces display arrogance and even sleaziness. But by having them stare straight down the barrel of the lens, it makes it feel as though they are staring at you, making us as the audience feel just as uncomfortable as Clarice feels. And when it cuts to a close-up of Clarice's face, she is not staring down the barrel of the lens, but instead looking off to the side of it, displaying how unequal the power dynamic is. If we look at feminist film theorist Laura Mulvey's theory on the male gaze, a term coined by her, we can more deeply understand how Jonathan Demme uses this scene to further reinforce feminist ideology. Mulvey's male gaze theory is that women in the media are being shown to us from the perspective of heterosexual men. This means that we are encouraged to sexualize them and objectify them as the camera looks them up and down and covers their bodies. Demi challenges this as he makes the audience see what the male gaze looks like from a female's perspective, which is truly confronting. We can really feel the uneasiness in our stomach and ultimately this threatening power dynamic causes Clarice to leave the room. Now why did an audience react so well to such a violent movie? Well, credits have to be given to the character Clarice Darling. Not only was she a female FBI agent, which at the time was very rare, but she had so much psychological depth that audiences, especially female audiences, could engage with because they saw themselves and their experiences reflected by her on the screen. Audience members now though, especially ones who are allies or identify with being part of the LGBTQIA community, find the portrayal of Jane Gum very offensive to the transgender community. As in the film, Jane Gum often wears the clothes of his female victims and is trying to create a bodysuit out of their skins so he can appear female. 
Demi, however, said that the character was not intended to be trans and has apologized on multiple occasions for not getting this message across. Although there are mixed readings of the film, The Silence of the Lambs has definitely become a classic horror and thriller film that will continue to be talked about for its representation of feminism. Now let's look at Darius Marta's film Sound of Metal and how it challenges ableist ideology. Ableism can be defined as discrimination in favour of able-bodied people. At the root of ableist ideology is the belief that people are defined by their disability and because of it require fixing. We can see throughout the history of media that people with disabilities are often represented by certain stereotypes. They can often be portrayed as the villain, the victim, the eternally innocent, and the hero. These stereotypes can be inaccurate and offensive. Stella Young, who was a comedian and activist, speaks about this ableist ideology perfectly in her TED talk. And when I was 15, a member of my local community approached my parents and wanted to nominate me for a Community Achievement Award. And my parents said, mm, that's really nice. But there's kind of one glaring problem with that. She hasn't actually achieved anything. (laughs) I would highly encourage you to watch the full TED Talk. Sound of Metal follows a heavy metal drummer, Ruben, as he rapidly loses his hearing and must confront a future filled with silence. The film has won a number of awards, one being an Oscar for its sound design. So to say the least, a large amount of people have really enjoyed the film and praised it for its representation of the deaf community. However, a lot of people also believe they could have done better with the casting. The lack of casting of deaf or hard of hearing people disappointed many who watched the film. Jade Bryan, a deaf filmmaker, said, There was a deaf cast, which is a good thing. However, I felt they were in the movie as a crutch to support a story about the main character. But with all this in mind, let's analyse the scene from the film to see how this ideology affected its construction. To set up context for the scene, Ruben got cochlear implants. He was then exiled from the deaf and sober community where he learned sign language and had been staying. The shared belief in this community was that being deaf was not a handicap, not something to fix. All of us need to be reminded of it. Every day. However, Ruben went against this belief and therefore could no longer stay. So he travelled to France to reconnect with his girlfriend Lou, but decides that leaving her is the right option. This is how we get to the setup of this final scene. Darius Marta uses the convention of resolution in this final scene. This convention is common among many films, where essentially the film ends with a scene of a main character accepting or coming to peace with their current state. Typically, throughout the film, this is something they have to learn to do. Unlike these other films though that often use dialogue for this convention, Marta relies on sound. This is evident in the beginning of this scene as we watch Ruben walk down and watch the beautiful streets of France juxtaposed with the sound he is hearing with the cochlear implants on. The sound is distorted and compressed, giving it this metallic sound, making it overall quite overwhelming to listen to especially when Ruben looks up to hear the clock from the bell tower chiming. But what Marta conveys to the audience is this sense of resolution, as this sound is very similar to the sound at the start of the film. As the distorted sound continues, we have this very intimate close-up on Ruben's face. Here, Marta uses the Kuleshov effect. Demonstrated and named after Russian filmmaker Lev Kuleshov in the 1910s, The Kuleshov effect is where rather than having one single shot, the audience derives more meaning from the interaction of two shots in one sequence, one of those shots typically being a close-up of a face. It can be seen being used in many films with the convention of resolution. In The Sound of Metal, that sequence of shots is the close-up of Ruben hearing the chiming of the bell tower, then a wide shot with a low angle, revealing that the bell tower is what is making the sound then it cuts back to a close-up of Ruben's face. This sequence of shots is repeated but without sound. This contrast of two sequences, one with sound and one without, is used to convey to the audience how Ruben is feeling, and ultimately, how he accepts silence. The Kuleshov effect tells us that the sound of the bell tower was just too much for Ruben to handle, because when it cuts back to the close-up of his face to focus on his emotional reaction to the sound, 
the audience sees that the sound is just too much to bear. So much so he takes off his cochlear implants and it goes quiet. It then jumps into the next sequence without sound. We see almost this shock and relief on Ruben's face that it's gone quiet as he looks back up to the bell tower that now is not ringing. Ruben and the audience are hit with this silence and understanding that being deaf is not something to fix. This is further explored as the scene comes to an end. Ruben sees kids across the street playing together. The same kids that at the beginning of this scene were fighting. This symbolic code used in the Mizon scene represents the peacefulness Ruben now feels and a close-up is used to confirm this as he inhales and looks up at the sky to reveal the sun shining through the leaves, symbolising this feeling of transcendence. Ruben can now sit and truly experience silence. The film ends in silence on a close-up of Ruben's face. Like many resolutions in movies, we don't know what is next for Ruben, but we know he has come to terms with his deafness. Both these films show us how ideology can affect construction of films and teach the audience how to be more open-minded. Thank you for watching.